Hello, welcome to the production engineering course. Uh, today at the topic four, we'll discuss on the surface facilities. So the surface facilities are uh, in this topic we'll uh, discuss on the equipments and the units and its operations uh, at the at the oil and gas facilities. Okay, so uh, let's uh, start it. Um, so what do what do we mean by uh, surface facilities and wh what does that I mean uh, what the surface facilities actually uh, stands for so well in this section uh, we'll cover the process applied to the reservoir fluids uh, that we produced from the wellhead and uh, how we actually produce it how we, we how we actually process the process fluids i mean the reservoir fluids and how we actually prepare it for the transportation and send it to the uh, processing unit for instance uh, refineries okay so um you should know like the oil and gas those rarely produce from the reservoir with an excellent export quality it never happened it always have the impurities okay so the impurities could be uh, with the oil the impurities would be the water the formation water would be in here uh, different types of contaminations uh, uh, for instance sulfur darts or the dissolved gas and if we produce natural gas uh, then in the natural gas there could be the vapor content and also the gas condensate nitrogen carbon dioxide uh, hydrogen sulfide and lots of other impurities actually mix with the oil and the gas so before we actually send it to the customers uh, we have to do a preliminary refinement okay we have to separate the oil gas uh, in its pure form and then we have to send it to our customers and the customer means we have to send it to the definaries okay before uh, uh, before that we need to uh, do the separations and in and in this um, topic we'll actually learn about these uh, things okay so um, the oil and gas processing facilities Okay, so these uh, actually depends on many uh, many factors. There are several factors actually uh, are important to uh, decide like uh, what the process facilities depends on. The first thing is like for instance like the produced volume. For instance, uh, the uh, the type of processing it require. Okay, it depends on the fluid composition or the um, like the production okay like the produced volume so what what this is means by the produced volume it does means like uh, what would be your facility size okay for instance I'm just giving an example um, you have assumed your produced volume is uh, 1 million barrel per week okay now that is that is your goal but when you actually uh, that that's how actually you have designed your facility and when you did your uh, appraisal and then you install your uh, equipment and everything after that when you actually start the operation all of a sudden you have seen you can produce two million barrel per week so I mean your equipment is become undersized okay or for instance if you produce less than that then your equipment would be oversized so this is this is very very important like I mean we have to uh, we have to check like I mean either uh, under capacity running the uh, uh, industry I mean the process units in under capacity or the over capacity or um, unnecessary process flexibility 
can be very costly okay so we have to think about that and the second is the fluid composition based on the fluid composition your process design would change how because um, for a crude oil with a light crude oil with a significant percentage of, uh, of uh, um, uh, gas dissolved uh, in here C1 to C4 and for the heavy crude oil a significant portion of tar which is of these uh, designing the equipment for these two would be very different okay for the light crude oil you need uh, a different types of separator to design than the heavy crude oil okay so that's exactly why the fluid composition is also very important okay and uh, uh, sometimes the condition are such process which is difficult or expensive to perform offshore can be exported to the coast to handle much easily on the land what does that mean that means location is another very important part okay why because if your field is in offshore or in arctic environment in that case uh, you have to take a special design consideration uh, for instance offshore uh, your uh, process facilities in offshore area okay now you need an FPSO okay or uh, different types of like offshore unit and tanker okay or subsea pipelines okay but if it's in the onshore then you don't need these uh, these uh, special consideration you don't need a tanker you don't need a subsea pipeline okay or you don't need an fpso like that so that's why the the offshore uh, operation would require a very special consideration again if you actually drill in arctic environment in that case uh, you have to uh, think about like the winterization of your process industry so what you need to do you need to um, uh, build the process uh, equipments either inside of of uh, of an unit okay uh, or uh, you need to uh, make sure your uh, your um, equipment got sufficient heating so that uh, your equipment don't break down all right so these are very important things we have to decide before we design a process facility okay and another important uh, part is the environmental regulation of the country you are actually drilling the food I'll give an example in Canada the environmental regulation is very high or, or for instance you are uh, you are actually um, uh, exploring in Arctic area okay so Arctic uh, area just like Alaska is uh, environmentally protected uh, environmental protected area so um, the the consequence of any leakage or any spillage would be way way higher than the normal operation okay so that's why you have to take a uh, special extra care so that is that is very important so based on all these factors we actually optimize the cost and after we do the cost optimization and we also for the safety okay then we actually select what types of uh, uh, facilities we should actually design all right so now let's talk about like the oil and gas processing section um, when we actually consider all these different sections then what we do so so uh, consider our physical process of the uh, oil and gas and we have we may have some unwanted fluids okay so from the wellhead uh, must go to to the reach of the product section and this process would include this okay what are this this is gas lead separation this is a liquid liquid separation and the drying of the gas from the produced water okay so um, from the reservoir we have oil plus gas plus water and some contamination okay 
So the first thing we have to do to remove the contamination, okay? Then we will get oil, gas, and water. And then we have to take it to the separator and we have to separate to oil and water and the gas will go out, okay? But uh, this gas would also contains a portion of the water too. So we have to take it to the dryer, okay? And the excess uh, vapor will go out and we'll get a dry gas, okay? And in here, the oil and water, we we'll take it to another separator, then we will remove the water and we'll only get the oil, okay? So this is how we do the separation. This is the separation process. Now, usually the process engineer or the chemical engineers, uh, they typically concern with determining the sequence of the process, like what would be the sequence? Should we remove the gas earlier or should we remove the water earlier? Which one would be economically beneficial? It tot as you know, like it, these things totally depends on on what on the produced volume composition of the fluid, okay, location, environmental regulation. So lots of different factors actually include. So the engineers they do the optimization, they optimize, okay, and then uh, using the chemical engineering principle the process engineers or the chemical engineers, they uh, utilize these uh, phase envelopes for the hydrocarbon present, the phase diagram and, and all other engineering tools, then decide what we are going to do, what are we going to do, okay? So, and when we decide, okay, what we are going to do, we will do the separation, separating the oil, gas and water. And then the process engineers, the next question would be to the facility engineer, how we are going to do that, okay? So before designing any process sequence or any process schemes, it is necessary to know the specification of the raw material input, okay? This is very, very important. The raw material, based on this raw material, we design the unit. We design the equipment, okay? So, uh, the composition of the raw material, okay? And the capacity. So, based on these parameters, we do the equipment sizing. Okay, I will actually come to this, uh, uh, this later, uh, the equipment sizing. This is a very important part, actually, um, for the design engineers. Uh, if, you, if you see the... Uh, any kind of a uh, job posting as indeed for the process engineer or the chemical engineers in oil and gas field lots of time you will actually hear the uh, this terminology equipment sizing okay so this is very very important we will actually learn uh, a portion of it like how do we actually do the equipment sizing okay we will not go to the calculation we'll just learn the process so designing a process to convert the fluids uh, produce the wellhead into oil and gas uh, products fit in evacuation and the storage is not that different okay there is no difference actually the characteristics of the oil stream or the stream must be known as the specification for the products agreed what does that mean that means your clients i mean you are the producer of the oil okay so for instance this is the reservoir and from the reservoir, this is the oil, this is the water, this is the gas, and from the reservoir, you got the oil, actually crude oil, okay? Now, you are the producer. So, the producer or the operator, okay? Now, you cannot directly sell this crude oil to the end user what you need to do at first you need to send it to the to what to the refineries okay and at the refineries what they do they make it like gas um, gasoline 
and uh, naphtha, uh, bitumen, wax, HFO, and various other things. Okay, so then these actually go to the end users, jet fuels, and so many other things. Okay, so here it goes to the end user like us for instance uh, we consume gasoline for the car or some other people they consume gas natural gas for for uh, for the gas stove okay the naphtha and kerosene has been used for the jet fuel the bitumen for the road construction hfo for the uh, for the ships uh, okay so there are many applications to the end user but here the from the crude oil to going to here the refinery okay. there are several sp steps you have to follow okay so the producer as a producer uh, your client is the refinery owners okay or the um, the process who actually process oil and field so what you need to do as a producer you have to your job is to clean up the contamination you have with the crude oil and if the crude oil got gas you have to degas it and if the crude oil also got uh, water content you have to remove the water content and if also the crude oil got the sulfur you have to remove the sulfur that means you have to provide your client which is a refinery company to the uh, to them the pure or clean crude oil okay or if you actually sell the gas you have to give them dry sweet natural gas okay so either dry sweet natural gas or sweet crude oil or like the clean crude oil you have to sell it to them so how you can do that you can do it by separation okay so you produce the oil you separate it and then you transport it and then send it to the uh, clients okay so this is how this is the uh, flow diagram so how you do that how you actually um, uh, separate the reservoir oils I mean the uh, reservoir fluids from the oils okay so here is the production from the reservoir oil what you can have we you have oil okay plus gas plus water plus contaminants or contaminations okay this mixture you would actually sell need to the separator now this separator and treatment there will be it's not one unit there are multi-stage okay multi stage separator the treatments and there you get the gas you got the oil you got the water and the contaminants okay and what you do you send this oil and gas to the customers and then they take it to the refinery okay and create the the desirable products for for the end users okay so this is how this is the oil and gas process schematics this is how you actually do the uh, uh, separate uh, do the separations this is the process of uh, doing the separations okay of oil and gas now um, the most important thing the quality and the quantity of the fluid okay so the quality and the quantity of the fluid that produced at the wellhead is determined by hydrocarbon composition, reservoir characteristics, and the field development scheme. Now, for the hydrocarbon composition and the reservoir characteristics, these you cannot do. These are dictated by the nature. Okay, uh, you don't, you can't change the characteristics of the reservoir, or even you can't change. I mean, if it's the heavy crude oil. You can't convert it to the light crude oil. Well, under some 
uh, special criteria you can do that for instance in in Alberta the the oil sands which is a uh, uh, which is a tar sand actually with the bitumen um, we take a special um, special processing then we actually convert it to we actually do the thermal cracking and mixing with the other types of fluid then we we actually uh, convert it to the uh, diluted uh, one but in most of the cases these are dictated by the nature so what we actually can do is like change the uh, change the process by the by uh, designing the field development scheme okay so we can manipulate the field development scheme and then we can um, we can manipulate it within the technology and then we can actually develop the influence of process design okay so what are the properties of the hydrocarbon properties that influence the process design like we can we can actually manipulate the technology and design a process so that it can it can give us better quality and the better quantity of the fluid okay so what are the what are the uh, hydrocarbon fluids um, 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 produce that uh, what, what are the hydrocarbon properties that influence the process the first thing is the PVT characteristics or like the pressure volume and the temperature characteristics okay which describes whether a production stream will be gas liquid form at a particular temperature and the pressure which is very very important okay to determine the operating conditions okay very important one the next stage is the composition as we have discussed before the composition of the fluid is very very important based on the composition of the fluid we design the uh, process units emulsion behavior this is another important part density and viscosity of course uh, probably you already know how important is the density and viscosity of a fluid okay and also the formation water okay how much formation water uh, it could have should we need a rigorous uh, scheme to separate the water or we can just use the preliminary I mean the primary separator and it can separate the formation water so this is also another very important part okay so in addition to that to the fluid properties it is also important to know how much volumes and the rates will change for the wellhead and over the life okay and the production profiles are required for oil gas and water in order to size the facilities you remember the term we use equipment sizing so this is another important part all right now um, it is important also to put a realistic range of uncertainties okay uh, in the scenario and also um, the, when we actually design the field development planning stage the project design becomes more firmer okay while designing a process for continuous throughput or like the continuous um, uh, unit i mean there are two different types of uh, process uh, units one is the batch process another is the continuous process okay so in most cases we in for the oil and gas industry we uh, design the continuous process okay so uh, in that case, the engineers must consider the implication of startup and shutdown of the process where special precautions will be required. Uh, this is important, very important, because um, in an, any uh, engineering facility, the startup and the shutting down one uh, process facility is most difficult job to do okay so that's why uh, we have to uh, consider and think about these uh, implications too anyways so the uh, end product specification okay of a process uh, may be defined by the customer by the transportation requirement or the storage consideration okay production significance uh, production specifications normally do not change because one may be expected to deliver within the narrow tolerance 
uh, but uh, it depends on uh, on like uh, negotiating with the customer too okay typical uh, product specification of the oil and gas uh, and water it could include the following parameters the true oil vapor pressure base sediment water content and some other uh, compositions so here you can actually see um, the typical product uh, specification that we give it to the cu customers and customers actually approve this okay so you will see like i mean the uh, the oil and gas uh, what would be the properties of the oil and gas for instance in natural gas the heating value composition these are very important okay and in in case of water uh, in case of oil the hydro i mean if any sulfur content uh, or like i mean in the gas sulfur content is also very important uh, so these these are very important parameter process model once the specifications for the input stream and the end products are known the process engineers they determine the minimum number of steps required to achieve the transformation okay so what are the steps these are the process yield the volume of gas and liquid from each stage interstage pressure and temperature compression power required for the gas cooling and heating requirement flow rate for equipment size implications of changing production profile so what does that this means this means like the uh, how much production yield you require what would be the for instance what would be the capacity and the purity i mean what uh, uh, the the composition or the purity of the product okay so within one step to another stage uh, what would be the change of pressure and temperature or like i mean do you you need the uh, compressing the fluid uh, for instance compressing the natural gas or not or like i mean cooling or heating or uh, should you have to use cstr like i mean continuous start heating reactor or not so these all the and, and what would be the flow rate for each of the uh, events so these all actually have to think about so uh, let's uh, look at this flow diagram and from this flow diagram you will have more understanding okay um, so this is an example of a process flow diagram or process um, flow schematic uh, we usually call it um, PFD or process flow diagram okay so production from oil uh, from the wells the oil gas and water and some contaminants okay we put it to the separation the treatment unit and there the water has been separated and it's water got a some portion of oils too okay then we put it the deoiling and the water is disposed and this oil what do we do we actually put this oil in here now this oil and the oil from the mainstream this oil is actually recycled in this place okay and the oil from the mainstream it's degassing that means it removes either carbon dioxide or uh, methane okay and then it's do the dehydration okay what is the dehydration removing water okay and then we get the pure oil and this uh, i mean pure crude oil and crude oil with no contamination and then we send it to the crude oil to the refinery okay now from here the gas okay and from the degassing we also get some methane okay so we'll actually recycle it and put it to the gas again okay so this gas we do the dew point conditioning what is the dew point conditioning we actually compress it okay and then we uh, remove the contaminants okay we compress it back again and then we send it to the gas processing unit 
and from the cache processing unit we send it to the uh, customers all right so this is how we separate the oil gas and water from the production well okay so this is actually explained in here uh, all right so what we have seen this we called the production flow scheme the pfs or you can also call it uh, pfd or process flow scheme or process flow diagram okay so um when we do the engineering uh, design the first stage we do the preliminary design and there we like block diagram and in the block diagram we uh, define the process in blocks okay and the second stage of the design is the pfd or process flow diagram and the third stage is p and i d diagram or process and instrumentation design so the more deeper we go the more detailed the engineering is okay so the block diagram and pfd these are preliminary engineering design and the pnid is a part of detailed engineering design okay so remember this uh, too all right so uh, in pfd what do we do we typically divide the process into the hierarchy differentiating the main uh, process from both the utility and the safety of the process okay uh, for example a process flow scheme for crude oil sustainability uh, crude oil stabilization must contain the detailed equipment line valves controls okay so why do we actually do that we do it in p and id okay let's see an example of the p and id so this is this is actually the PFD, but uh, process a uh, main process flow scheme. But we have the instrumentation diagram too. Okay, so this is actually a P and ID diagram. I mean, the earlier one was a was a um, process flow diagram. Okay, and the block diagram is something like that. Block diagram looks like this, like. Uh, just like the blocks like oil gas water we use the separator okay and using the separator we remove the gas we remove the water and then we get the oil so this is an example of the block diagram okay but in process flow diagram this is a little bit more details and in PNID, as you can see, um, we did explain like where should we need the valve, where we need the, this LC is the level controller, um, where we need pump and what would be the specification of the pump, uh, what types of valve we need, okay, and what, what, is the, what is the definition of the streamline. So all these informations we actually use in the, in the PNID. Diagram. Okay, so this is actually a preliminary PNID diagram. This is not detailed. This is the main. I mean, this is something uh, um, uh, combination of PFD and PNID, but it is not a detailed PNID diagram actually. Okay. So, uh, for instance, here it is given an example. Like I mean, V one one. This is a vessel one one. This is a vessel one o two. So, uh, vessel one one got loop. Uh, pressure production separator okay this is a low pressure production separator vessel 102 is a crude oil stabilizer vessel okay and equipment what are the equipment we have we have p 101 that means pump 11 okay to stabilized crude oil pumps all right so and uh, these are like the operation streams that means the pipeline the number of the pipeline so it's specified like number one what do we have uh, vapor and liquid phase okay and what is the composition density everything of the of the stream has been defined in here so now the process engineers actually use a software that's called HISIS hydrocarbon systems okay HISIS so using this software we can easily 
um, easily calculate, I mean, calculate the, uh, the easily do that this uh, detailed calculation. So we don't use actually pen and paper right now. So uh, I will actually show you the interface of HiSys how it actually looked like. Let me check. Uh, let me check at the Google so I can actually show you. Uh, so this is the HiSys software actually. Uh, production optimization for the olefins, uh, for the optimization for the refinery. Let me check the olefins. Let's Managing a refinery or chemical plant to increase efficiency requires a new way of thinking. The isolated processes used by planners, schedulers, engineers, and operators make it increasingly difficult to optimize profitability. Tens of millions of dollars of margin are left uncaptured every year. Enter a new world, a digital world that transforms your business by removing silos and dynamically optimizing critical functions inside your plant. Introducing Unified Production Optimization, a vertically integrated approach to break down barriers and synchronize operations using minute-by-minute -minute data to make you more agile, responsive, and profitable. With unified production optimization, planners take into account selected crudes and committed product deliveries to develop an optimal operations plan. Plans that are frictionlessly updated by digital twin models created by plant engineers to represent current conditions. Schedulers then operationalize this plan, taking into account real-world constraints. Shared models and data, never before accessible, unify the plan and schedule, leading to an easily adjusted and fully aligned schedule. At the operating level, teams work together to centrally leverage multivariable process control to run the plant closer to yield and energy limits. Adaptive self-healing technology maintains peak performance, increasing throughput up to 5% in each individual unit. Beyond the improvement in each unit is the central jewel of unified production optimization, dynamic optimization that autonomously reconciles real-time data and applies it at the appropriate time to achieve new benchmarks of performance across wide functional areas. It coordinates and adjusts the underlying APCs to help you match and even exceed the plan. At the same time, it provides feedback to planners and schedulers to create a closed loop for continuous improvement. Supercharge your refinery or plant with a digitalization strategy that unifies operations and helps you unleash your full potential, both in profit and sustainability. Learn more at aspentech.com. All right, so uh, this is about the high seas. Um, um, unfortunately, high seas is very expensive. That's why um, we don't have a, um, I will actually not be able to show you any simulation how to do the high seas, which would be really awesome actually, because high seas is amazing. Like, I mean, you can, you can do a lot of different um, uh, process modeling. Uh, the downstream or even the midstream actually let's uh, let's see about the midstream okay like the um, dehydration process acid gas removal or like that the upstream like the I guess compression analysis uh, by flow gram and at the downstream uh, following there are so many so many applications of high uh, uh modeling so we can actually do especially optimization okay so um uh, if you actually, uh, if uh, I will actually try to um, give you some uh, information on the HiSys, how you can use HiSys, so it would be really, really great. So it would be super awesome. Um, let me check if I find uh, any um, any video uh, on HiSys. Uh, Two phase separator using the high sys. Okay, so today or is used for or how what you can use it to simulate in as water from extract liquid. So here uh, gas. the uh, the process modeler is actually using a two phase separator, okay, to uh, separate uh, oil stream. 
So how you can do that? At first you have to uh, define the, the streams, product streamlines, as you can see in our um, in our lecture note, these are the streamlines, okay? Then you have to decide the what types of separator we actually use. So this is separator, as you can see, uh, the vessel uh, 100, so this is a type of like separator. So, and when you select the separator, after that you have to uh, select the pressure, temperature, and the volume content, as you as you can see in uh, in here too. Okay, we have to uh, consider about like the what would be the uh, design pressure and temperature, everything like that. And when you define the streamlines, after that you have to uh, when you define the fit streamline, like water and oil, then you have to put the vapor outlet, the uh, top would be the uh, vapor and the bottom streamline you have to define everything and after you define the pressure temperature and everything okay then um, you have to uh, define all the energy input you need to provide okay and then we do the sizing okay and later on we Defined here is the condensing. Uh, we actually have defined how many power input actually required for this whole process. And here is the another separator we actually uh, included. Okay, another uh, uh, three phase separator. Okay, so this is how you can actually uh, easily do this uh, all this simulation uh, using Aspen Hisis. Okay, so to design the the process all right so well uh, since we don't have the high seas but I, we can actually uh, learn theoretically okay how, how we can actually design the surface facilities so uh, let's uh, go to our um, uh, let's return back to our um, uh, slide surface facility so a process flow uh, scheme is uh, one showed typically would be based for preparing preliminary equipment okay advanced ordering for a long lead equipment time preparing the preliminary planned output supporting the early cost estimation uh, basic risk analysis and the engineering design sheets okay surface facilities so um, this is the uh, steps we actually use for the surface facilities and uh, the flow diagram. Um, so this is the actual flow diagram. You remember I showed you in here. Uh, I told you like I mean uh, the block diagram, process flow diagram, PNID. So let's go in detail. Let's learn about the uh, about the engineering project. Okay. The first step we do the feasibility analysis at any engineering process. Um, let me explain to that what does that supposed to mean. I mean. Uh, what types of feasibility analysis we do and how it actually works. So that means uh, let's uh, think about a case study. And the case study is uh, you are a production engineer and you have uh, 10,000 barrel oil per day okay uh, 10,000 uh, barrel of oil per day you have this project uh, your production rate is 10,000 uh, barrel of crude oil and it's a heavy crude oil okay so the first thing what you would consider you would consider like I mean is it feasible to design I mean is 10,000 a barrel is it enough 10,000 barrel per day is it is it feasible and profitable for me if you do the analysis and you think it is feasible then you should go to the next stage and the next stage would be definitions of preliminary design that means how it should look how it can be built what would be the cost so uh, in these uh, under this we actually do the uh, block diagram 
and we also do the process flow scheme or process flow diagram okay and then we do the um, uh, cost estimation after we do all of these things and these satisfies okay the cost estimation looks promising then we go for the next design and that is the detail engineering design so here we developed PNIT and process and implementation design and the detail engineering design with the assembly instructions and everything and when these stage is also done then we go for the procurement to get this and after the procurement we do the construction and when the construction is complete we do the commissioning phase we go for the commissioning phase that means we make sure it works all right and sometimes with the commissioning we do the trial production okay and after that uh, we got the trial production and we start our production and when we get our first production we start selling it and then we do the post project review like could we have done it better why need to do that because the next project so that you don't have to start it from the scratch so that at the next project you can improve the whole process okay so this is the step of the of the surface strategy all right now uh, in this section uh, we're going to uh, describe the hydrocarbon processing preparation for the evacuation evacuation means like i mean uh, send it to the customers okay either from a production platform or a land-based facilities uh, that means uh, is splitting the hydrocarbon well stream into the liquid and vapor phase or treating each phase so that they remain liquid or vapor uh, throughout the um, throughout the evacuation route okay for example crude must be stabilized to minimize gas evolution during transportation by tanker and gas must be dew point Conditioned to prevent liquid dropout during the evacuation of the gas plant. What does this mean? This means, um, I will give you an example. Um, I was actually working in a, uh, in a project in, in South Korea. And in that project, uh, that was pretty much interesting project. It was um, South Korea, uh, they uh, import crude oil from from uh, Qatar. Okay, Qatar got a huge uh, natural gas it's true. Anyways, so that crude oil was a light crude oil. And as you know, light crude oil got a big portion of uh, dissolved uh, gas, methane gas in there. Okay, so when Qatar actually sent the light crude oil with a tanker, to the South Korea at the port of Busan when uh, when it reached. Okay, so during the loading and the unloading of the crude oil uh, from from this large uh, oil tanker. Okay, so for instance, this is the oil tanker ship. they had 3% loss and why because the methane that release or it called VOC volatile organic compounds that means methane ethane propane butane so the release of VOCs due to the release of VOCs they have 3% loss in each trip which is very very high okay so that is that is a big challenge for for the for them actually so that's why uh, the minimize the gas uh, evolution or the VOC this is very important and another thing is the gas must be dew point conditioned to prevent liquid dropout what does that mean I was working in another project in that is in Toronto actually, and in that project, 
uh, our customers, they were from uh, United States and they had a pipeline, a natural gas pipeline that is from uh, El Paso uh, in uh, Texas to Oklahoma City. Okay. And in there, when they actually, uh, this is a gas transmission pipeline. And in there, they had another issue, like, I mean, when they actually uh, sent it to these, uh, uh, sent these gas, uh, they had a problem with this, uh, uh, with, the, with the corrosion, actually. And the pipeline integrity had issue. Why is that? Because one of the reasons, there are several reasons, but one of the reasons was the natural gas got the condensates. And what are the gas condensates? Just like crude oil got dissolved VOC in there, which is methane, ethane, propane, butane, those are things like that. Natural gas had some oil condensate, the small droplets of the oil. Okay, so if the temperature goes low, then what's happened, these condensates, the oil condensates actually get condensed, okay, and it creates dew point. I mean, if the gas is below to this dew point, okay, then this condensate appears and this gas condensate, this can actually hit uh, to this, since it's in very high pressure, it's usually like I mean, 700 uh, PSI. Okay, 700 PSIG. So this uh, liquid condensate actually hit this uh, natural gas pipeline and it can destroy the pipeline. Okay, so this is exactly why we have to be very careful about that so that our uh, crude oil don't have any VOC, any contamination or even any uh, water con droplets. And the same with the natural gas, it don't have any condensate, oil condensate or any water content okay if there is any water content we have to remove it if there any oil condensate the ideal case we should actually remove it if we cannot we should be very careful it don't go beyond the dew point okay these are very important things and when these all are satisfied at that time we do the separation we start doing the separation process how we can actually see that um, uh, the oil or the gas they, uh, these are above or below the dew points we can actually check the pvt diagram the phase diagrams okay from the phase diagrams we can actually uh, see the behavior of the multi-component mixture okay at a certain um, temperature and the pressure we want to uh, we want to uh, transport the fluids okay um now let's uh check about the separators, how the separator actually work. So the separator feed is oil, water and natural gas. So this portion is the natural gas. So if the feed goes in there and there are, this is the baffle and it goes throughout the baffle and it separates and the gas go out. And uh, this oil and gas separator actually works due to the, due to the uh, gravity. Okay, so gravity is the main driving force. So water is heavier than the oil, right? So water actually gets settled down at the bottom of the tank and it goes out. And the oil was at the top and it skimmed through and then it goes from here, okay? And then oil is separated and go down this way okay so this is how the separators this is the main working process of the separator this is actually explained uh, these things in here okay so these are like I mean explaining how all these different units actually work now when we get uh, when we get this gas this gas also can contain a small droplets okay so the small droplets of uh, oil or water how we can remove it we can actually send it to another separator what type of separator it could be it could be cyclone separator or it could be um, um, uh, dehydration unit 
So it depends what types of uh, residue we have. We do the composition, the analysis, and if we see the um, uh, droplets are more like, I mean, gas condensate, we send it to the cyclone separator, or if most of the time, it, I mean, if, if uh, it contains like the water content, then we send it to the dehydrator. But if both contents, then we actually send it to the both, the cyclone separator and the dehydrator. The similarly, uh, the oil could have uh, uh, water content okay in here so what do we do in this case we send this oil to another separator okay and what types of separator we use we can use absorption or adsorption tower okay so we send the oil in there and then the water is been removed and we get the pure crude oil from here okay and this water we just uh, separate this water and throw it out or we can actually use it in different other purpose so this is the uh, things actually explained in here all right so um, please go through there and you can actually learn about the, about the scenarios so this is the kind of like mesh we utilize uh, for this uh, for this uh, centrifugal or the cyclone separators right residual time or the residence time residence time is another important part like i mean how much time we need for each batch for the for separating so typically it's the one minute uh one to two minutes uh, for the light crude oils for the heavy crude oil three to four minutes but sometimes it goes uh, up to 20 minutes okay uh, for for very heavy crude oils but mostly uh, one to two minutes for the light crude oil uh, three to five minutes for the heavy crude oil something like that okay all right so uh, in summary uh, the separator sizing it depends on three main factors one is the gas velocity okay the how much gas we can actually uh, put in here and what would be the velocity outlet velocity of the gas okay the viscosity of the or the residence time and the surge volume allowance okay or like the up, up to 50 percent over normal operating rates okay so these are the uh, three different factors we we use for the separator sizing okay uh, so uh, the separator types, we have different types of separator, the vertical or the horizontal separators for different types of operations. We use different types of separators, okay? For instance, uh, if it's a light crude oil, in most cases, we use horizontal separator. For the, uh, for the heavy crude oil, we use the vertical separator. Why is that? Because for the light crude oil, the viscosity is lighter. Okay, I mean, it is, uh, the viscosity is lower. So what's happened, uh, and, uh, and the evaporation rate is also very high, evaporation rate for the gas. So what's happened, the gas, it got more surface area, and it can actually degas very soon, and the gas can go out, okay? But in case of heavy crude oil, the viscosity is very high. So if we use a horizontal separator, the resident time would be very high, okay? Since the viscosity is high, so it would move very slowly. So the, one of the, uh, that reason we use a vertical separator for the heavy crude oil, but there are the exceptions. For instance, the uh, offshore platform, okay? The offshore platform is a small platform but in the offshore platform, if we use the, the uh, vertical separator, it will take less space than a horizontal separator, right? So that's why we don't use horizontal separator in our offshore platform. We usually use the vertical separator in there, all right? So there are, uh, these are the factors we actually use. And we already have uh, uh, discussed about like the working principles of the separator. Uh, please uh, go through these uh, slides and we also have discussed like I mean 
uh, how much water uh, we should actually have. Okay, so that typically um, a crude oil, the sales crude oil, it should have less than five percent of the water. Okay, and uh, ranging from zero to ten ppm of water before disposal. So this is the environmental regulation. I remember it; it's very very important, and. Um, and that's exactly why we have to do the dehydration or uh, free knock out the vessel okay so uh, this is how we knock out the free water from the vessel using the separator okay um, this is that continuous dehydration tank unit so wet crude oil free gas and heat it up the gas actually goes out and the water goes out this is the oil and it's a continuous process how we actually do the dehydration so dehydration means removing water okay um, so but the space and weight are consideration the, um, the plate separator may be used for the dehydration of the crude to evacuate I mean to, uh, to evacuation specification that means based on the specification of the crude oil we have to design or we have to select like what are the uh, units or the plates of the separation separators we actually choose okay so uh, there are different types of uh, uh, consideration we should take for the dehydration unit for instance for the very high viscous uh, crude oils the heaters can be used for a combination with the dehydration tank okay if there is the emulsion we have to take extra care extra difficulties is in there okay and we can use a chemical um, I mean the chemical destabilization um, is one of the most common method to use to uh, determine most suitable combination of chemicals for the for this operation deoiling is another important part okay so uh, remember that is uh, to reduce the oil contained to uh, 50 to 100 p uh, 150 ppm so this is our goal uh, that's why uh, the water we need to throw out okay uh, should not have the oil content so that's why we do the de-oiling okay the, through the oil scheme right so why we need the deoiling before throughout the water to reduce the oil content level to meet the disposal standard okay and it is often necessary to employ rather more sophisticated method okay to such technique which may be reduce the water uh, 40 ppm what are these techniques gas flotation and hydrocycline separators okay so the this is the hydrocyclone separator actually looks like and it gives us less than 30 ppm of water okay and our regulation is it should be less than 40 ppm so it definitely goes with along with the uh, regulation another is the um, uh, this um, uh, what is this this is the cyclone separator okay and cyclone separator also give us less than 30 ppm okay so this is uh, these are the themes we can actually work now um, that was about oil um, the oil processing we have uh, discussed now let's uh, um, talk about upstream gas processing though so all these contents we actually learned um, those are like upstream oil processing and after the upstream oil processing go we actually send it to the downstream so and there is a process involved in the midstream which is pipelines so through the pipelines we send it or pipelines of the tankers we send it to the downstream and downstream are the refineries okay uh, now let's uh, talk about the upstream gas processing so in this section gas processing will be described in context of the site needs and the evacuation okay so how many how gas may be processed for for disposal disposal or like I mean sending it to the uh, sending it to the customer by transportation by pipeline or even uh, through LNG or NGL okay 
So the gas fraction and the liquefaction will be described at the downstream gas processing. So at the upstream gas processing, it is, is what? It is removing the contaminations, okay? And at the downstream gas processing, it is the gas fractionation. That means if you have a mixture of C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus C4, that means methane, ethane, propane, butane, if you have the mixture of that, then you have to separate it, fraction it. That's the downstream uh, gas processing section. And also liquefaction, like converting it to LNG or NGL. Okay, CO2, C4. Okay, so these are the downstream gas processing. And what is the upstream gas processing? The upstream gas processing is uh, dehydration and uh, removing condensates, gas condensates. Okay, so this is more like I mean upstream gas processing. Okay, so let's uh, let's do that. So to prepare the gas, uh, natural gas, uh, I already have explained before, if you remember, so we need to remove water because the water vapor can create hydrates and also instigate corrosion. We'll actually discuss what, we, what are the hydrates and how the corrosion actually creates. Um, it can contain heavy hydrocarbons and that would be creating the wax deposition of the pipeline. Also, it can, um, it can do the pitting, pitting erosion. Okay, so that's why we have to remove the heavier hydrocarbons. And also there are contaminations like carbon dioxide or sulfides. Okay, so these will also instigate the uh, corrosion. So that's why we have to remove it. Okay, so this is very important. Now, the gas processing facilities generally work best uh, between 10 to 100 bar, okay? At low pressure, the vessels um, have to be large enough to operate efficiently, okay? Uh, whereas at higher pressure, the facilities can be smaller, but the vessel wall and the piping systems must be thicker. Otherwise, what can happen? Otherwise, it can be it can be rupture, okay? So remember that. The optimum recovery of uh, heavy hydrocarbon is achieved between 20 to 40 bar, okay? Long distance pipeline pressures may reach 150 bar sometimes, okay? And reinjection pressure can be reached as high as 700 bar. That means like, I mean, uh, uh, let me explain this thing. So sometimes the gas pipeline can be like 10,000 kilometer, for instance, okay? So that means after a certain length, we have to boost up the pressure of the pipeline, okay? So for instance, after each 100 kilometer, we have one compressor station, gas compressing station, okay? Now, at the head of each compressors, so the or we call it like the reinjection pressure the gas pressure can in, increase way 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 higher okay sometimes i mean 700 bar is too much but it, it can be like i mean uh 200 to 300 bar sometimes okay or like i mean uh 1500 psi even 1500 psi something like that or like i mean um 2500 psi even 3000 psi actually i have seen uh, some, some pipelines so this is this is why this is very very important to know about these things okay so the gas sometimes produced at very high pressure which have to be reduced for efficient processing and to reduce weight and cost of the process facilities the first pressure reduction is normally across the choke before well fluid pri enters primary oil and gas separator, okay? Now, um, the gas dehydration is very, very, very important, okay? What we actually do, we remove the water from the, from the, um, 
from the uh, natural gas. If we do not remove the water, then what's happened? Let me explain. For instance, this is the natural gas pipeline. Okay, uh, you have methane, and uh, usually the temperature is something like we try to maintain uh, 10 degrees Celsius to like I mean uh, 15 or 20 degrees Celsius for instance okay but the pressure is sometimes very high it could be as high as uh, uh, 1000 psi sometimes okay in most cases it's like uh, uh, 600 to 700 psi but sometimes it can increase way higher okay now if the methane if it's dry dry means there is no water at all then it's fine but some cases the we cannot actually completely dry the methane at all so what's happened there could be some water particles in here okay then what's happened since it's in very high pressure okay and if the temperature reduced significantly in some place give you an example um, if the gas pipeline is in uh, is in a very cold region okay or any abnormal situation happen for instance any zul thompson effect happens in some part of the of the pipeline so what's happened the temperature can reduce significantly at negative temperature okay so in that case what's happened these water particles in here it got freeze down very quickly and it don't get freeze down only with it it got freeze down attaching some methanes methane uh, molecules trapped inside the water molecules okay and then they create ice like um, formation like ice like material and these ice like material these we called gas hydrates okay and these gas hydrates, um, these are not ice actually, these are ice-like material, okay, but this can clog the entire pipeline, okay. So look at there, this is the hydrate formation bar. So at this temperature range, like 0 to 10 degrees Celsius or like 20 degrees Celsius or 30 degrees Celsius, okay, at this region, operating pressure region, there would be no hydrate, okay? But low temperature and high pressure, that is the main problem of the hydrate. So if your operating pressure goes beyond this point, and if the operating temperature goes beyond to this point, then what's happened? There could be a possibility of hydrate formation okay so what are the hydrates looks like this is the hydrates actually looks like okay all right now these hydrates could be so dangerous so in many cases we have a pipeline rupture and even pipeline had a uh, explosion due to this hydrate deposition okay so the hydrate can be uh, performed by number of methods cooling absorption adsorption okay so we can actually do the dehydration to uh, remove the hydrates and sometimes we can actually um, mix uh mix uh, some some kind of chemicals to remove the the gas hydrates too okay so there are several methods so one is like uh, absorption like uh, we can put like the um, uh, absorption water by using triethylene glycol or teg we can actually put that and then it can be absorbed by the glycol okay and then water can be removed 
okay and we can also use the adsorption technique and adsorption technique is uh, like uh, using solid desiccant okay solid desiccant to uh, to absorb the water and then what we can do we can heat up this desiccant and this water can go out and we can regenerate it okay so absorption is something like we mix the glycol with the gas bulk and then um, this extra water actually dissolved I mean uh, sucked up by this ethylene glycol and then it can go out okay so there are different uh, types we can actually use so this is one of the example of the glycol okay uh, absorption absorption process all right so uh, heavy hydrocarbon removal uh, how we can actually uh, uh, remove the heavy hydrocarbons so uh, gas condensates or like the hydrocarbon inside the gas this is another big challenge for us okay so we have to remove it how we can actually remove so the wet gas wet gas means gas plus condensate okay don't uh, don't confuse it for like I mean gas is wet means like gas got water no gas got condensate that's what that um, uh, glycol means so the wet gas feed and we have the glycol injection if there is any water in here it could be absorbed then we have this uh, Joule Thompson valve and put the separator and the gas will go out through the pipeline okay and the, uh, con the condensates will be coming so what is what is Joule Thompson valves actually do what is the Joule Thompson effect Joule Thompson effect is like uh, is uh, just like the refrigeration works for the Joule Thompson effect that means if if the uh, if the in inlet channel is very narrow and uh, gas actually flow in a very high pressure then all of a sudden if the gas actually expand then the gas temperature will be significantly lower okay and in that case the gas condensate would be uh, condensed down and the condensate will go out and the dry natural gas it will be going out through this heat exchanger and we can send it to the pipeline okay so this is how the low temperature separation or using the Joule Thompson effect we actually uh, separate the gas condensate okay so when the high pressure is not available if we cannot use the Joule Thompson effect in that case we can use the refrigeration to cool out the gas so instead oh, sorry instead of using the Joule Thompson effect we can use the refrigeration coil in here to cool down the natural gas and uh, and then we can actually separate the gas condensates okay um, contamination removal the removal of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide is very very important because the the hydrogen sulfide it is not only corrosive it is also very very toxic okay even a human human actually breathe the hydrogen sulfide in a very small amount it can be fatal okay uh, there is something we called like uh, uh, um, uh, LDS little dose okay LD50 actually or like uh, the LC50 little concentration of the little dose 50 so the um, hydrogen sulfides LD50 is very low that means like it is um, it is very very toxic okay so because of the uh, because uh, of the hydrogen sulfide is very toxic we have to extract the hydrogen sulfide and the carbon dioxide from the natural gas okay and that's how we should actually use that so how we can actually sorry how we can actually remove we can actually extract carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide by you see absorption tower okay um, uh, that's how we can actually remove these uh, toxic materials okay uh, and this is the um, this is the compression tower so once we actually remove all these uh, contaminations after that 
we use a pressure swing uh, compressors okay we, we increase the pressure of the gas in by, by using the several stage okay it depends on the compression ratio and after several stage of the compressor compression then we actually send it to the natural gas pipeline transmission pipeline and we send it to our customers okay so this we called the uh, midstream process midstream process the gas transmission pipeline okay and after the midstream we got the downstream gas processing and what is the ga downstream gas processing that means we separate the natural gas okay we we fractionate the natural gas so natural gas uh, got c1 which is methane c2 which is ethane okay c3 which is propane and c4 which is butane okay so methane if we uh, cool it down and refrigerate it we can actually get the lng and for all others we get the ngls okay so the natural gas liquids so we can actually we can actually use uh, that so uh, then uh, this is this is how we actually do this so uh, lng ngl and lpg okay probably you heard about the lpg tanker ngl tanker or lng tanker okay so this is this is the uh, terminologies of the natural gas how we actually do that all right so um, the butane propane can be further isolated and sold as the lpg okay and uh, uh, the methane the sales gas which is typically methane and very very few upper amount of ethane can be refrigerated and compressed a factor of 600 well um, and cooled to uh, minus 150 degrees celsius and we can sell it as lng okay so now um, there are lots of uh, lng terminals are in this world like I, one of the lng uh, terminal canada is uh, is actually trying to build in in uh, british columbia is the kirimat in kirimat okay there is another one um, in nova scotia he is trying to build so hopefully it will be built so that we can uh, you can see like i'm in nova scotia got the lng uh, terminals too to get the lng tank uh, okay um contamination removal except for all these we have some contamination could be darts and slugs and everything so we can actually uh, use the uh, use uh, several units to remove the contaminations okay and so this is the way we do the uh, the demethanizer okay and remove the contamination so what are the types so although gas may have been partially dried and the dew point controlled uh, prior to evacuation from the cells to the production site some heavier hydrocarbons waters and maybe some non hydrocarbons still present okay so we should use a demethanizer okay to isolate most of the methane components for the sales gas okay so so that it can be practically free all the waters and the contaminants okay so this is how this demethanizer actually works we expand to the compression and you get the natural gas okay so the gases which are high uh, hydrogen sulfide we need to desulfurization which got uh, high carbon dioxide we have to remove it okay and water can be removed by either by adsorption or by absorption techniques okay so remember all these um, natural gas liquids recovery remember we had these uh, uh, when, I mean the natural gas like I mean in natural gas we have 
uh, if we have ethane, propane, butane, or like heavier hydrocarbons, we can actually um, 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 fractionate it and sell it uh, to the market. How we can actually do that? So the initial feed, feed would be C1, C2, C3, C4. Now, for the methane, the fractioning temperature, like the uh, boiling point, of the methane is very low okay and comparing to these others so based on these uh, um, these uh, uh, this evaporation um, um, the, uh, the characteristics of its evaporation we use this uh, fractionating column to fractionate the the, using the cooler and the heater, heater at the bottom, cooler at the top, and that's how we can fractionate and it's the residual fruit uh, feed to fractionate the the uh, methane, uh, ethane, propane, and butane and residuals. Okay, like that. So the first column removes uh, uh, ethane and then i mean methane it actually removes uh previously that then it removes the ethane then it removes the propane and then butane and then if there is any gasoline it removes with that so this is an example of ngl fractionating plant so the ngl means natural gas liquid so after we remove methane successfully we still have ethane, propane, and butane. So we put it the mixture, and this is the deethanizer. And from there, we get the ethane. It goes with the pipeline. Then we get the depropanizer and the debutanizer. Cool down. We get the butane, and at the bottom we get the gasoline. So some gasoline too. Okay. So this is how. We already have the methane, and then we can get the ethane, we can get the propane, we can get the butane, and the gasoline. Okay. Now, what we do with this, then we actually sell it to the markets. How we actually sell that? Uh, again, so this is the production platform, and from the production platform, we do the field processing. Here, we do the field processing. This is upstream. Upstream processing okay and in the upstream processing what we do we remove carbon dioxide hydrogen sulfide water and other contaminants okay and after that we compress it and we sell it to the uh, we send it to the downstream processing section Okay, and at the downstream processing, what do we do? We do the fractionating. And there we fractionate methane, we fractionate uh, ethane, we fractionate propane and butane, we like that. And this methane, we actually get LNG with butane and propane, we convert it NGL. Okay, so this is how we do this, send it to the uh, end users. Okay, so this is the schematic of the full chain LNG facilities. Okay, this is the, this is the exact thing I have described. So please go through that and if you have time, uh, go through this uh, YouTube link so that you can actually have more better understanding okay so in this lecture we have learned on the surface facilities especially how we separate uh, how we uh, separate the produced oil and natural gas um, at the upstream midstream and the downstream okay and um, and this this is the uh, end of the lecture slides and well uh, if you have any question on this uh, please let me know but i think like it's pretty much straightforward uh, and very very easy to follow through the questions 
all right uh, take care and uh, have a nice day to you goodbye